And today I'm thrilled to welcome a friend who is has um, mutual uh, passions uh, for uh, persons who have experienced traumatic brain injury, a topic that is near and dear to me. I welcome today Brandy Lancaster, who is who works um, with this population, but also uh, represents on a regional and statewide level for a topic she's bringing today about how you as therapists uh, can uh, uh, work with and better understand uh, the new laws the uh, and all that that entails. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Brandy, uh, welcome today and uh, uh, please start sharing your screen right. and tell us what we need to know about working with um, Hi. Sounds good. All right. All right, can you guys see that okay? All yes. right. Perfect. Okay, like Deb said, I am Brandy Lancaster. Uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I also want to say happy Traumatic Brain Injury Month. I mean, traumatic brain injuries aren't happy, but it is the perfect time for me to be presenting to you all on traumatic brain injuries um, and what we can do to help our students with TBIs from mild to severe. Um, I have no financial disclosures. So I am a speech pathologist. I have worked my entire career, 26 years um, in the education system. I am a state licensed and ASHA, um, the American Speech, Hearing and Language Association certified member. I'm also a traumatic brain injury liaison for Region 4 North, which is Lynn Benton and Lincoln Counties here in Oregon. Um, I have traumatic brain injury has always been a passion of mine since my master's degree. So I have 26 plus years of research and working with um, students from birth to adulthood with traumatic brain injury. I also have 21 years of personal experience in my home um, with people with traumatic brain injury as I am the parent of two young adults with brain injuries. I always think that it's important for specialists, um, anyone, parents, specialist students to understand why traumatic brain injury matters to me and why I'm so passionate. I am the parent of two absolutely amazing young people with very different traumatic brain injuries. Um, this is my son and my daughter. I do have permission to have their photographs here. I did ask them before that. Um, my son sustained his injury at seven months old. He has known nothing but the life of someone with a traumatic brain injury. My daughter, normally developing, and she sustained five concussions, which are brain injuries between the ages of 15 and 18. Um, so she knew she used to be able to do things differently. So they are part of my why. I just wanna share some statistics with you for the state of Oregon. Um, students, people with brain injuries are significantly under-identified everywhere. Um, but here in the state of Oregon, there are approximately 2,000 children, just children, treated in emergency rooms or hospitals yearly for brain injury. 15% of these children will not completely recover and they'll require some type of specialized support 504 or an IEP. Um, and that means that cumulatively from kindergarten through 12th grade in the state of Oregon, there should be approximately 5,200 students being supported on IEPs with a disability of traumatic brain injury. At this moment in time, we have 337 and that's from birth to transition. So that doesn't, that that's beyond the initial paragraphs statistics. Um, we're not including in this, those zero to five in the, in the top numbers. This doesn't include children who have gone to an urgent care or seen their primary physician or children who didn't seek any medical um, supports for their injuries. So there's a lot, there are a lot of students who need our supports, um, all 
OT, PT, counseling, speech therapy, academic supports that simply aren't receiving them. At the bottom there, um, in your slides, the blue and the green are all live links. I'm not going to pop over to those. Those are just for you to look at more information. Um, but there are some additional um, statistics from the Oregon Health Authority on the number of brain injuries by region, and this is for children. And um, the second link is the causes of brain injuries. Very frequently, we think of sports, but that is that is only a tiny part of our students um, in the school setting who've had brain injuries. I have students who have fallen from second story windows. Um, we have a new case in our region of a child um, just getting ready to graduate this year who is in a coma in the, in the intensive care unit right now with a massive head injury. So it's that was a car accident. There slips and falls. There's a ton of different um, reasons for the injuries. So I want to be sure you understand, um, because I am a speech pathologist and I don't walk in OT, PT, or any other service provider shoes, I did not create these slides alone. I contacted my occupational therapists that I work with, my physical therapists, students, other parents, and asked them what they felt it was important for service providers to know. Um, some of the things that were said. When, when we look up at the two ribbons at the top, the ribbon with, they're both green. That's uh, the green with the sunflowers is a ribbon for invisible disability. Many of our students with traumatic brain injury, this is an invisible disability. We, they, they look absolutely normal on the outside. The changes are internal. The, there's changes to their brain. There's changes to their neurological system. The, the uh, oh my God, oh my goodness. The ribbon on the right, the green one, is uh, the ribbon for traumatic brain injury. So you see they're both green. One just signifies invisible injury. Um, the, another thing one of my occupational therapists really wanted to share was they have very often have very poor self-awareness. So they'll, they, they go and they go and they go, and then they hit a wall. Oftentimes, because some of them are socially aware, they know what is, is expected at school. They push themselves at school and they push and they push until they can't anymore. And, and then shut down or they have behavioral meltdowns because they've just had enough. Um, they're overstimulated by sensory stimuli. They can hear the buzzing of the lights and there's too much noise or their clothes feel awkward. Um, there's a tag that's irritating them. The lights are too bright. Um, they struggle with anxiety. Very often anxiety is the first thing that they'll struggle with. Depression comes later as they're realizing what they struggle more to complete in the school setting or in the social setting. Um, peer and social interactions often change or disappear. They, uh, one, one of the students said, we, I, I need people to know we're not lazy. Uh, we're students with traumatic brain injuries are some of the hardest workers you will ever meet. What they struggle with is those, are those executive functions a task, understanding how to get started, and then understanding how to complete the tasks and an adult or some type of structure reminding them of the steps. Uh, a parent shared this with me. Um, injuries that happen earlier in life do not mean that there's a better outcome. Very often we think because of the plasticity of the brain, they're going to develop new skills, new neural connections, new ways to create and learn. But what the research has shown is that students who have their injuries earlier in life, infancy, in, in their toddler years, their outcomes are actually poorer than children who have injuries later in life. Um, the current research being done there's, I, I believe it's in Alaska, and we're doing some in Southern Oregon right now, is there's a high population of adjudicated youth 
with unidentified and untreated brain injuries. So these children haven't had the support that they need to develop, to participate in, in school, in life in an appropriate way. Behaviors have gotten in the way and they end up in, oh my goodness, why can't I think of the words? <laughs> they end up incarcerated. In, Thank you so much, ding, ding. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So there are things we see and there are things we don't see with brain injury. I, I, I'm going to talk, and our case study is more on is, um, the hidden impacts. See a student ha who has had a traumatic brain injury that has hearing aids or who is wearing glasses or has a cane because they've got vision impairments or there's obvious gross or fine motor deficits, they're in a wheelchair or, or they're using a walker, they have AFOs. Those are things we can see. What we're not seeing is diffuse axonal injury. We're not seeing internal damage to their gray matter. You know, if, if there's been something that's penetrated their skull and damaged their actual brain. Um, I have worked on a, several cases this year where there a closed head injury has led to my student having a stroke in addition to the initial brain injury. Chemical changes in the brain, the, the dumping of sugars and hormones and, you know, all of those chemicals to try and balance what's the injury that's just happened and heal the cells that have been injured. We can't see those, but those make changes to how the child can function on a daily basis. So, when we have a student who's had a, a brain injury, concussion to severe brain injury, and again, concussion is a mild brain injury, we might have an ITAP, and I want to address what the ITAP is um, here in the state of Oregon. It is the immediate temporary accommodations. Those are accommodations that can be put in place for a student who has had a brain injury and needs to be accommodated to access their education, but may not at this point be far enough along, have long lasting impacts to require a 504 or an IEP. Um, I'm sorry, I'm looking down because I'm gonna pull up on my phone. This actually came up from Siebert's website last night and Melissa says it very eloquently. Following a concussion, the goal is not to let the temporary injury change the trajectory of a person's life. Temporary accommodations allow a person to recover without life-altering impact. If we put in supports immediately, we would reduce the likelihood of long-term impact. Most students, most kids recover, but they need these temporary accommodations so they don't fall behind and get in a cycle of failure. That's what the ITAP was created for. We know that there has been an injury to the brain, from a concussion and that there are going to be, not for everyone, but there are going to be changes in, in the way that student processes. And the changes will depend on the severity of that concussion. So the ITAP is meant to put in these temporary accommodations and to be monitored so that that student doesn't fall farther and farther behind. And, and like Melissa said, get into that cycle of failure. Um, then we have the 504, which I will assume that you guys are all familiar with, and the IEP. People who you might encounter on these teams, parents um, and other family members, the student hopefully is going to be part of that. Um, what the research shows us is when they're able, the student's creating the goal for how they want to proceed with their um, remediation has better outcomes than us as adults selecting the goals for them. Doctors, private therapists, caregivers, and then from the school setting, I'm not going to read all of these, but OT and PT are really important members of this. And there's so many different things that they can help the accommodations team, that ITAP team, the 504 and the IEP team do for the student. There are recommendations that can be made from your professional standpoint as you're watching the student and seeing the impact of their injuries. 
So some of the things you might see in a student's records or in observations after they've had a head injury, um, visual motor integration deficits, a lot of trouble with R point copying. So copying from the board down to the paper on their desk, um, writing deficits, either with penmanship. Um, organization is something that's not always thought about by, by the team, like knowing again, how to initiate that writing task and then how to organize their thoughts into a cohesive paragraph or even a cohesive sentence. Um, sensitivity to light and sound, decreased processing speed, um, emotional outbursts and lack of inhibition, those kind of go together, poor body awareness, um, feeding needs, toileting issues, gait problems, being able to transfer from their wheelchair to a seat from from their wheelchair to a toilet or any any type of transfer that way. Fatigue is a huge issue. Um, again, difficulty initiating and completing tasks. When we're looking at specifically more at like a psych ed report, um, poor working memory scores. I think about very frequently children in the high school setting um, who've had a brain injury and learning a second language. I, my son went into Spanish and the teacher said, oh, he, he does everything I'm asking him to. He just can't. He's just not getting the Spanish. Well, his working memory wouldn't allow him to hold that information and manipulate it into a new context, learning a new vocabulary. So he couldn't hold that information in his brain and play with it to learn that second language. So that's just one area that working memory would significantly impact. Um, for organizational skills, I like to talk about um, when I'm working with teams, if, if you're seeing their backpack and their desk area and it looks like um, an office supply store exploded, but they know where everything is. That if, if you think about what that looks like outside, that's kind of how their mind is organized on the inside. So there's a lot of organizational issues. Um, a heightened sense of fight, flight, flee, and fawn response from the injury. Um, one, one thing that I learned recently is once you've had that injury and there you've had that fight or flight experience, the threshold for your next fight or flight response is lowered significantly. So it takes less for you to get into an emotional state that initiates that fight or flight response. Um, again, disorganization of space, property, thoughts and language, anxiety and depression, increased behavioral outbursts, tremors, balance and coordination issues, decreased strength and decreased range of motion. I think about an observation I did for a student and they, the, the staff was like, he's just, he elopes, he leaves the classroom. I don't, I don't know why he just gets up and leaves. So I came in and I did an observation of the student. They were in the middle of a math lesson. The student had been identified as a student with significant language impairments post-injury. So I'm watching as the language lesson is, or the math lesson is happening and they put the worksheet in front of him and the teacher goes up and begins to instruct. And it was on acute ob and obtuse angles, scaling, all this absolutely amazing math vocabulary. And the minute they began using that vocabulary, he put his pencil down and got up and walked out of the room because he didn't understand the vocabulary. He didn't understand what these things meant in relation to the worksheet that was placed in front of him. But what the staff saw was just a student avoiding the task. When I sat down with him, he was able to tell me, I don't understand this, and so I just left. So one of the things I've been really trying to work with with my teams um, from the ITAP all the way to the IEP is putting those accommodations in place. Um, and I want to just really quickly say universally designed instruction. The majority of these accommodations are uni universally designed instruction that 
all students should be able to access to do well in their academic performance. What I caution, not everybody implements universally designed instruction is documented. Put it in that ITAP, put it in the 504, put it in the IEP as accommodations in case the student moves somewhere else. I know Deb has done amazing work trying to get information out about universal design. Um, and, and it's happening more and more and more of my IEP teams are saying, oh, that's part of our academics. But I always ask them to put it into those documents in case the student moves. So one of the, one of the things I really want to address is being sure as we're doing our work that these accommodations are in place. It kind of goes back to that cycle of failure you as an OT, you as a PT are working on these motor skills. You're working on the feeding. You're working on their organization, their writing skills, um, so many things, their sensory things, their sensory needs. Um, but if you're addressing those and you're helping them to develop new skills, you're helping them to develop compensatory skills, they're still lacking. They're still not able to access things like a neurotypical peer in their classroom. So putting these accommodations in place to be sure that they're getting the academic information and giving the output is absolutely critical. I think of students um, like the text-to-speech. Yes, the text-to-speech and the audiobooks. So our students are not reading at grade level. They can decode, but they're not comprehending it. So they now can't or if they're reading a literature book, um, they're not understanding that. But if they could hear it, they'd be, they might be able to understand it better. So they're getting access to that while we're teaching them, while we're helping them compensate for skills that they may have lost due to their head injury. Um, one thing I've been asking my staffs to do also is um, put in for math and, and science as we get into the higher grade levels, a laminated page of formulas. We're not giving them the answer or showing them how to work the problem, but if we remove the piece of trying to remember that formula for a child who already has memory deficits, then they can show us what they know. Do they know what to do when that formula is given to them and they don't have to recall it? What these accommodations are really looking for is, can we get from this, this child what they actually know and are able to use while we're helping them to develop, again, develop those skills or compensatory strategies to do these activities more independently in the school setting? Um, I am not going to read through all of those for you. You guys know how to read. Um, one of the things I have seen across all of my students with traumatic brain injury is hoods. They, they wear their hoodies and they put them on. Um, that helps kind of narrow their visual field. So they're not getting a lot of the peripheral interruptions. It helps them to focus forward. Where I saw this um, personally, I was teaching my son to drive recently and he was driving with his hood on. And he said, well, why is that police officer staring at me? I said, son, you've got your hood on. And he reminded me that it helped him stay focused on the front of the road. So one of the things I told him is, when we get your glasses next year, we'll get glasses with a, a wider side because you shouldn't be wearing your hood while you're driving. Other students will wear um, the hoods on their hoodies in the classroom because it helps not, not just with the visual, but it helps kind of mus muffle exterior noises that might be bothersome to them. Um, when, as a practitioner, you get to the point of assessment and qualification for students with traumatic brain injury, I just want to address really quickly how important, how critical it is that we all look beyond our standardized scores. When we pull a student out and move them to a testing room, that's kind of an artificial environment. You, I'm sure, are all aware of that. It's you and the student in a separate room that's quiet. You may be able to dim the lights. There's the ability to um, remind them of what the task is and help them focus and walk them through things. Doing 
observations outside of that and looking at how they actually function in their day-to-day setting um, is critical because most of our students with traumatic brain injury, they can do good in that one-on-one setting. They can perform well when there's an adult to remind them, when there's not all of the external stimuli uh, distracting them. But when you put them in the real-time environment where there's 30 other kids in the classroom and there's someone walking by and the door just opened and somebody came in and turned the lights up and then the teacher put music on, that stimuli, those lights, the noises, the things happening in class diminish their ability to perform those executive functions functionally in the classroom setting. So we need to be sure that we're doing that dynamic assessment with them and looking at not just one place. I I think of when I do observations, I try and look at what's happening at recess, looking at a, a language arts or reading activity, and then looking at a writing activity. I also try and take some time to talk with the teacher. Show me some work samples. Let me see what they're doing. Okay, let's try and do this activity with adult with an adult or some visual supports. I had a young man who was working on writing the amount on coins. So the direction, it was a big blank page. The directions were read to him, create five coins and write these different amounts on them. So he was able to create the coins. They were all over the page. He had some difficulty with, you know, understanding where those coins needed to be. And then as he wrote the amounts on the coins, they didn't stay inside the circles. So then the teacher and I went back and wrote little lines. This is where each of your coins needs to be. Highlighted the circles to let him know that the amount needed to stay inside the coin. When we provided just those lines and that highlighter, he was able to complete the task and get credit for it. Be sure I'm not missing anything. Okay. With this, just encourage teams as practitioners out there to put these accommodations in place, even though many of them, most of them are universally designed instruction um, so that when another team receives the student, if that happens, they are aware of what this child requires to access their academics. All right. One of my occupational One of my physical therapists asked me, what do we do? What do we do if we think that there is a student who has sustained a brain injury? Um, First and foremost, you want to notify the office, the school school nurse. There should be procedures in place in every school for how to handle a student who has had a brain injury. There should be. I'm not promising you that that is the case. We do have some schools where there aren't procedures. In that situation, I would be sure to contact, um, if the student has an IEP or a 504, contact their case manager so that they can contact the, the appropriate people. If that's not possible or if there is not follow through, um, even if there is follow through, I would recommend con- contacting um, the traumatic brain injury liaison for each of your regions, and that's on the next slide, um, or Siebert. If you can't contact your liaison, if you contact Matthew or Melanie or Melissa at Siebert.org, they will put you in contact with the appropriate traumatic brain injury liaison for your region in the state of Oregon. One of the questions I've been asked probably four or five times um, just in this last year is, what does it really matter if we have the disability changed on an IEP um, to traumatic brain injury? Um, and my response is it does. It does. Um, while many students have executive function disorders, students with autism, students with other health impairment for ADHD, um, students with learning disabilities, Many of our disabilities are it's disabling conditions. Those students have executive function deficits. Where the difference is, is for our students with brain injuries, that's, that's the result of an assault to their brain. So there may not be the ability for that brain to recreate and develop those skills. 
we may be teaching them compensatory strategies. How do we work around this injury and, and the deficits this injury has caused to develop a different skill to be able to complete that executive function task? Y using lists, using graphic organizers, using reminders on their smartphone or um, a watch that has reminders to stay on task. Um, it, it does it does make a difference. It does matter when we're working on treating um, injuries that aren't necessarily going to develop, but require compensatory strategies instead. All right, so this is um, the map. This is when, when you go to the Siebert link on the prior slide, it will take you to a page that has a map of what region is where, and who your traumatic brain injury liaison is. Um, please always refer back to the Siebert website because while many of our traumatic brain injury liaisons stay the same, it, they do change from year to year. So it isn't always going to be this list of um, specialists here. Sometimes that changes. This is current from last week. So these are the liaisons for this moment in time. All right. So I feel like I've sped through these, Deb. We're to the case study point. Well, I think this is the point where we, uh, you know, take a deep breath and absorb okay. all that you have said, some uh, amazing statistics and and a good overview of uh, working with kids who've gone through such a trauma. And mm -hmm. just it, I invite anyone to share stories or comments, of course, we're going to move into the case study. But if you have any um, questions that you would like to ask of Brandy, um, this is a good time to do that. I have a question um, about safety concerns around personal boundaries for kiddos with TBI. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm super curious, I'm trying to coordinate right now with a um, their private OT and PT, just so that we're using common language in the school. Mm -hmm. And the private had shared that they didn't really have anything that they were going off of. They were just having direct communication. Um, I was wondering like how important is having that common language? Um, we have a young lady that loves to give lots of hugs and um, she's young. So we're really not sure where this might lead, um, mm -hmm. especially because they're oftentimes not the most appropriate hugs. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so is this particular student receiving any speech and language therapy? Um, so she just had a motor vehicle accident mm -hmm. last um, spring and just got on IEP. I believe she does have speech language, um, but not a lot. It's okay, a so that would absolutely, and I can talk to this because this is my field. Um, that would absolutely be something that a speech and language pathologist could address. Um, okay. The pragmatics and the social skills and learning. There are some amazing programs that I, I think of, and I know there's more than just this, the Circles program, okay. where it's a very visual program that teaches the student who's in what circle and what behavior is appropriate for the different social circles. So that first circle is like family and people who love you and that's okay. It's okay to give them hugs. The next circle is people who are close to you, but you might not necessarily give them a hug. You might shake their hand. So it goes through, it's a very systematic approach to teaching them who belongs in what circle. Um, and that's something that can be implemented in um, a, a special education setting, but also through a speech and language therapy for social skills. Thank you. That was a fabulous question. And there, with, with our students with brain injuries, inhibition and the ability to stop themselves from doing something. Um, I, I think of how many times in my son's life I have heard from him. I know I shouldn't, like I, I knew I shouldn't have been doing that. I just couldn't stop myself from doing it until it was too late. So that, that ability to filter and say, oh, don't do that it, for many 
of our students with brain injury is is compromised. And I think it also leads to potential for abuse, uh, sexual abuse, of course, that, uh, you know, we have to think about because that kind of need for a connection on on whatever level that is can lead just to some dark places. So helping them get something in their memory bank um, to to stop themselves and be able to think is the challenge. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. kind of where the crux of it is, isn't it? Thank you well, and that. I also, I think, uh, Becky, uh, uh, when you're dealing with older children, um, older elementary, junior high, high school, when there's an injury, there is loss because of behavior changes, changes in personality. A lot of these students lose their friend groups. They, they lose um, positive reinforcements that they've had previously. So along w- with what Deb was just saying, there's, you know, there's a, a tendency to seek that affection and seek that input in ways they haven't had to before because they're different. Thank you. And and the... I think we probably all have somebody that when we think of traumatic brain injury that they pop into our heads. Uh, Mine was my, uh, my dad a number of years ago after a brain in, or, or after a car accident. And as a person with assistive technology, I kept trying to find ways to fill in those uh, deficits, uh, those kind of things. But one thing that was really challenging was the anger um, and the impulsivity. And I just kept thinking that this person now, if he watches a ship on television and the ship is going down, that became his reality. And so when you question reality and, you know, everybody's different, of course, but he would worry and, and, uh, you know, get stuck on things that he thought were reality. So when I think of if I went through my day and everybody was telling me that I was wrong, uh, it it would be really hard not to get angry because, you know, what what happened here? Uh, So in the beginning, we kept thinking his file drawers would go back into place because that's what we were told. And uh, after a while, they became the most wonderful stories. So you kind of went along with it and said, really? I don't remember owning a purple zebra, but thank you for reminding me. So, you know, there just, there comes points where it it can't be all of that fight, but you understand why uh, somebody might react with anger um, all the time. So. Well, and and for some, for some of our students, the file drawers do go back. The difference is there's no tabs on any of the file folders anymore. So they're just pulling file folders out, trying to find this frame of reference. They know it's in that file drawer that's that's back in their brain, but there's no tabs on their files anymore. Have your hand up. Please share with us, friend. Sure. Uh, so I actually just have um, a couple different questions um, just from things that I've been asked within our district. So, you know, you mentioned like your son had an injury at seven months, but, you know, you are aware of it and, um, you know, we're able to monitor and follow. Have you found, you know, when we're getting a student who's school age and coming in and they're, they're exhibiting behaviors or signs, um, but they've never been identified as potentially having a TBI and people might be chalking it up to autism or ADHD or some, some other disorder. Have you found any particular assessment that either yourself or your um, professional peers do um, to kind of help tease it out? Like, is it a TBI or is it really ADHD Um, or what resources they can do for that? Okay. And, and that, like, that is on this next slide for me to address. Okay. Um, Okay. Make way. (laughs) For my, no, no, no. I I will address it right now for my teens. And it's happened four times in the last three months on teams that I'm working on with my ESD for evaluation. The injury happened so young. How do we know that this is what it was? Credible history document um, that is on the ODE website for evaluating. So in the midst of COVID, we went from having 
required a doctor's note identifying the student had a traumatic brain injury to having this credible history document to qualify a student as having a traumatic brain injury. And that is critical because one, very often traumatic brain injury that young is not documented. It's not billable. So with, with my particular child, it, it wasn't documented until we saw the neurologist. He bumped his head, all the scans were fine. It, it wasn't documented as a brain injury. So what, what we do when um, on, on our team when we're going through the credible history is really have a deep conversation with the parent about, did you see changes when your baby rolled off of the bed and hit their head? Did you see changes in their infant behavior after? Was there more crying than normal? Did some of the things they had start, started to develop, did you see regression in those? And, and literally in every case we've had in the last three months, the parent was able to identify changes in their child's behavior that didn't go back to normal. They didn't get back to that baseline behavior from before the injury. So really it's kind of a, a teasing out of those infant developmental milestones and did they change after the injury? Um, and, and one of the things I tell my teens is some of these children are, are predisposed, like attention deficit, ADHD runs in both sides of my family. My son was predisposed to ADHD. What that meant for him was that the brain injury made the ADHD symptoms so much more difficult for him. So even if you're predisposed to a, another disability, a brain injury that young has the capacity to, to make that other disability much worse. So it, you know, another disability may in fact exist, um, but really teasing out. So assessments, assessments are really, really hard. Um, what I look for with assessments with my psychologists is patterns. I look for the patterns in their brief. I look for the patterns in their processing um, speeds. I look for the past, just patterns of what a typical person with brain injury is going to exhibit. Um, you know, we have all of these functional skills, but then we have a working memory and a visual processing speed in the 60s. That, that can be very indicative of someone with a brain injury. And now, now that you mentioned it, so the other thing that I've had is sometimes, you know, the TBI eligibility is not common. Um, <laughs> and so sometimes when you're sitting down with a school psych and you're reading the TBI eligibility and trying to look at like, what is the documentation that you might need for proof? And a lot of times school psychs are asking, well, like, what tests can they do? What tests should they do? And I... I've been part of Siebert before in the past, so I know that as a resource, but um, just also wondering, like, is there any, like, go-to tests or assessments? Like, I mean, you mentioned processing speed and working memory. I think if our school psychs, like, we could say, like, here's the five tests you should consider, but obviously, you know, their judgment. Like, is there any anything like that that so you I highlight? Know I know that my team that's working um, very diligently with students with brain injury is using the brief okay. um, a lot. We actually just, our ESD just purchased, and I, I apologize that I it, I don't know this off the top of my head. Um, and, and Deb, I don't know if you have a way to, when I get this information to get that out to this team. We just purchased another evaluation specifically for looking at and tracking symptoms and traumatic brain injury. Um, one of our psychologists did, and I just, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I can get that information to Deb if, if it's possible to get that out to this team. Yeah. We will find and, a way to do that. We'll somehow, okay. if, yeah, we can include it in handouts or, or something like that. If okay. you get me, get it to us. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yep. That's great. And then I get the other thing that I know we've experienced is just, you know, something might happen when the child's young and it seems like they resolve and they're fine from it. But then as they advance through the grades, like middle school, high school, and with the cognitive load increasing, and then they start having mm -hmm. presentation, 
Um, just wondering if any advice or how you kind of present it to the team that we might need to go back and look at this. Um you know, because in elementary school, they weren't being tasked to certain right. demands. And so they were able to handle it. But now with the cognitive load, they were just melting. So I, I kind of present it just like that to the team. Okay. What, you know, we, I, I think of it, like for me, it starts about third grade. Third grade, we have gone from like the reading to learn, to learning, learning to read, to reading to learn. So we're that's when the cognitive load really begins to increase for our students. And that's where we begin to see more behaviors, more of them just kind of falling apart at school because it's not so structured. There aren't so many of the visuals. Um, as a speech pathologist, what I say to my teams out in the schools constantly is um, visuals should always be provided, no matter what grade you're in, because... When I give information to someone verbally, I give them a set of directions verbally. Um, if they forget or if they get distracted midway through, then they're dependent on me. They have to come back to me or to someone else to get that information presented again. If we put it out in a visual format, in a written format, they can continue to be independent. They can refer back to that visual format by themselves to get back on track. Um, I think I totally just lost track of the question you were asking. I'm well, sorry, it, it's got so many layers to it. Yes. It does. And, and you yes. know, to think that in the beginning, if somebody didn't realize that maybe a little impact was enough to trigger something, you know, that credible history brings out conversation and somebody says, oh, and I do remember that, but I didn't think it was anything. We also need to remember too, and your your daughter, I think it was Brandy, had what, five concussions? Yeah. So if that happened more than once, and pe it, you know, particularly if it was sports or something, even if it started early, I mean, it by the time somebody is really getting to those cognitive loads, there could have been so many things that happened um, and in between there. One one thing that's very hard is you're, um, I have a student who fell in and hit his head. It He had to have it, his scalp stapled back together. When he got to the ER, oh, he's fine. There's no concussion. They did, they did a CT. Um, there, what a CT will show you is if there is a brain bleed. It's not going to show you that diffuse axonal injury. It's not going to show you the, the hormone and chemical dump into that child's brain from the injury to, to their neurological system where they impacted. That's not going to show up on that scan. So the parents are walking away. No, it's fine. The doctor said it was fine. He just needed his scalp stapled back together. So there, there's work that Seabird and, and our liaisons are really trying to do to get information, not just out to educators, but out to healthcare providers, trying to bridge um, bridge some of these gaps between the ER, the urgent care and the hospital and the school system. Because I was told my son was fine. And so we went along with life. And it wasn't until he hit first grade that I was made absolutely abundantly aware that this injury was directly impacting impacting his academic access. Wendy, I see you have uh, unmuted, so we can bring this wanted, one back around. Yeah, Go I kind of wanted to add to that. I think the other thing, um, you know, that I've heard a lot, it's they're like, oh, no, they don't have a brain injury. They just had a concussion. <laughs> and it's it's like, no, that actually is, yes. is one. Um, and so I think that's the other part that you hear, you know, just kind of people writing it off. That and they must have recovered completely from their concussion. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that the liaisons in Oregon have talked about, um, and I think there were some discussions with Echo Ties, they're not Echo Ties, with ODE, sorry, um, about changing the label, label from traumatic brain injury to just brain injury. Be because there is that, oh, it was just a concussion. Um, and I think in an earlier slide, that was one of the things that I said, a concussion is a brain injury. You, you, they, they may recover three to six weeks from that, um, but it is still a brain injury. 
I, I try and think of it like a broken bone. Some broken bones are really, really bad. They're going to require, you know, surgery and orthotics. Some broken bones, not so bad. Put a cast on it. Six weeks, they're done. It, it, it's, if you think about brain injuries that way as well, some brain injuries, they're, they're going to get those accommodations. We're going to cast them up with extended time, um, reduced um, amount of assignments, being able to leave the room if they're overwhelmed. And at the end of six weeks, if we've accommodated them and casted them in the right way, the hope is that they're going to heal from that injury. Some of, some of our students are not. Some of them are going to have longer lasting impacts from their injuries. Yes, uh, absolutely. And I want to get to your case study, of course. I, I, I just want to reiterate that Siebert and the team have done a wonderful job with all of the recordings and webinars. And so there are uh, things that are recorded on their site, great courses that your teams might want to look at. Uh, they have done lots of research in Alaska and now have been given a task of supporting uh, brain injury across town access uh, given a new grant so they are one of the world's leading um, in this area um, and uh, Shannon said uh, bet there are many unrecognized well I think your slide showed that there are a 322 I think was the number 317 across the state we know that there have been more many more incidents than have been reported so that's why we're talking about it yeah. And so um, thank you for all your comments. And Brandy, go ahead and tell us about this case study to help us relate it to an individual. Absolutely. Um, so because I, these are the positives. This is what Andrew could do before. Andrew is a 16-year-old 11th grade student. His injury started before this, but at this point in time. Um, prior to the injury, normal to advanced developmental milestones, good attendance, above average academics very highly engaged with peers, school, social activities, a leader in his community. Um, he played football. He's a wrestler. Um, he enjoyed painting and doing wildlife photography. He did work a part-time job, was highly involved with family activities, and was university bound. This student wanted to go to law school. Uh, the reason I put up the pre-injury is the impact of these injuries was to what he could do from before. So here is a history of Andrew's injuries. They are four concussions. The first concussion happened while he was hiking. He fell three feet off the back. He was piggyback riding, fell three feet off of the back of um, someone else, straight onto the back of his head. They were out in the middle of nowhere. So there wasn't a hospital that they could get him to quickly. Um, Mom noticed some pupil distortions. He immediately started talking about a headache. The sounds, um, they, they were out near the coast. So the sounds of just the nature sounds were bothering him. The light as they drove through the trees, the flashing of the lights. He drove the whole way home with his eyes closed. Um, at this point in time, there were no accommodations made in the school setting. About four months after that, um, he had returned. There was summer break in that time, returned and was right back at football. During the game, um, there was a play where he was thrown several feet and his head bounced, um, the front of his helmet bounced off the turf. He continued playing for two more, um, two more plays before he went to his athletic trainer and said that something didn't feel right. And they pulled him um, and determined that he had 22 of the 22 concussion symptoms. Um, and I, the reason I addressed that he continued to play, I've seen the video of the impact. Um, and I just want to talk about Max's law. The coaches all saw it. The athletic trainer saw how hard that child's head impacted the turf. And they should have pulled him immediately and given him at least one play, you know, to kind of let the adrenaline get out of his system and, and for him to begin to feel that, to feel the differences he felt after those two other plays. Um, the concern 
with that was had there been another one, there could have been a second impact syndrome. So there could have been significant neurological damage done if he had had another concussion within those two plays. And it is the responsibility of the coaches, the athletic trainers, the adults. Students don't want to come off the field. And again, there's all that adrenaline coursing through this child and they let him make the decision to stay in the game. They should have pulled him. So he he started having some visual um, discrimination deficits, um, headaches, a lot of fatigue, emotional dysregulation, trouble with more trouble with lights and sound, anxiety, dizziness. Um, he felt like he was going to throw up for probably about two weeks after this. Um, he was returned to normal play after two weeks. Nobody required a physician um, to document that he was back to baseline. So they allowed the student to go back onto the field without a doctor's clearance from that concussion, um, which is actually against the law. Concussion number three happened about three months later. I'm sorry. Yes, three months after the second one, um, there were still symptoms from that second concussion. Um, but they allowed him again to go onto the wrestling mat. He hit his the front of his head um, on the mat and actually lost like everything blacked out for about 30 seconds. He was not unconscious. He just couldn't see anything for about 30 seconds. Um, at that point, he was taken to the physician and his doctor put him on the six phase, six phase step up plan um, where he would have to check in with his athletic trainer to be sure that he was not symptomatic at each phase of this. Um, symptoms continued to increase, visual discrimination deficits, headaches, fatigue, emotional dysregulation. So two weeks after this, um, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to also state that at this, with this injury, concussion number three, there was a broken collarbone and a dislocated shoulder. And so much of the attention was given to that physical injury that could be seen. And not a lot of attention was paid to that brain injury. Two weeks after this, um, he was involved in a car accident where the airbags deployed in his face. Um, and for six months and beyond, he remained symptomatic. So this is a lot of concussions in a, in a short amount of time. Um, what we saw post-injury, and this was after the second injury, he continued to be a hard worker. Um, he was persistent. He was able to follow single step directions. This is a high school student. Um, following single step directions, he was recalling auditory information, decoding at grade level, but his comprehension of written material that he was reading was not at grade level. So he could read it, but he wasn't retaining what he read. Um, he continued to want to read and write. There was strong familial support and a lot of outside therapies. This um, some of the physical symptoms we saw, and this is where our OT and PT might be called in, um, fine, fine motor deficits for writing and activities of daily living. Like he could tie his shoes before, he could button and zip his pants, and he was having difficulty um, doing these activities of daily living independently. Decreased endurance, decreased range of motion. You guys can read all of that. Lots of sensory issues. Academically, there were significant declines. So I, I want to ask the team, I'm going to go back. When you look at this injury, these injuries, where do you, where would you feel you, the team at the school level should have started? Anyone? All right, I'm going to jump in here. I'm seeing responses. Now that okay, people okay. are thinking about it, I'm seeing so far unanimous after number one, hey. start at the beginning. What would you have done at at concussion number one? Would you have looked to a 504 or done an ITAP? What would you recommend as a team? Randy, was this, uh, was the, at, at step number one, was that identified by a physician or just reported by the family? Reported by the family. Mm -hmm. 
So that's one of the challenges. I think sometimes helping to make that a little bit, not, not to legitimize it more, but to help that process, you know, work more smoothly. But if they never go to the doctor, I think that happens across a lot of things. People are embarrassed or awkward or feel they're responsible. And yep. uh, I made a comment about coaching in sports, volunteer coaches, even young adults, teenagers who are coaching other kids. I have seen across practices, kids mm-hmm. getting bumped in the head without a helmet with a bat, you know, a ball in yep. the back of the head. I've seen yep. lots of those kinds of things. And those things are not getting reported. Parents don't even know sometimes. And Chandra's, so think- po- Chandra's point too, about if you don't have insurance, that's not the first place you go exactly. um, necessarily. But I'm seeing people say I tap that they would start with the eye tap and yep. then of course taking them making sure they're not playing sports at that point but the eye yep. tap is a good place to start but the parent needs to bring in this forward because the parent if it's not brought forward nobody knows that ever happened so while it's well i agree it's really important i do think it's challenging because you and i randy i've picked up a few kiddos that we have found yep. that have a long history a long history of something that probably <laughs> should have been identified sooner and it's even documented in some medical records in our students files if you dig a little and we aren't finding that information it's not being brought forward and so so. the challenge is really getting families to understand this i I guess at least partly because they're the ones that are there Uh, manaz uh, go ahead you have your hand raised friend oh i was just gonna say um we started addressing this in our district and what i'm finding from a school standpoint is case managers the people that are on the front line seeing the changes don't always know what to do. You know, they try to brush it off. They're educators. They don't have that clinical lens and trying to get them to talk to the school nurse or talk to the counselors or the social workers to kind of start that conversation that something's changed. Yeah. Um, I think it's one of the first lines, especially if parents are afraid or embarrassed to tell um, school teams something happened. I mean, there's so much, um, I don't know if it's shame or whatever it is that parents don't want to display the truth. Like, they're gonna and I jealous. will, I will address that. It absolutely is. I so my son's head injury, he was in my care when it happened. He's twenty, almost twenty-one now, and it is still shameful to me. It is still embarrassing to me as a parent that my infant child was injured so drastically that it changed the entire. Pro- trajectory of his life. The reason I talk about it constantly is because I want other people to know. It, yes, it is embarrassing. It's it's humiliating. It's devastating as a parent. And there is a lot of that. There's a lot of shame. Um, I, I think about a couple of situations where I have students who were in the care of a, a parent's significant other and now have shaken baby syndrome from the significant other. So there's shame in situations like that, where I left my child with someone I thought would care for them and they injured them instead. So that is a huge issue. It it is. It really is. Thank you for bringing that up, Leslie. Okay, comments. So all the comments that we're seeing here just are supporting, uh, you know, the, that more awareness is on, on all stakeholder levels is important. Yep. And I also, uh, uh, as Melissa talked about the other day, Siebert is also focusing on prevention and doing a lot of work around, uh, you know, particularly on playgrounds and uh, making sure that kids are safe. So uh, it yep. just it takes conversation on all levels. So go ahead and tell us what actually happened with this student. So the, <laughs> bless the student's heart. So the family did a ton of outside supports. Um, they began physical therapy um, specifically to work on the range of motion and strength. Part of that had to do with the collarbone and the dislocation, but it wasn't just that. Um, they actually took the student to the head co clinic out of uh, U of O which has um, like an executive, a a set of speech and language pathology students who work on executive function skills um, with anyone who sustained a brain injury. So they did a lot of executive function therapy with the speech pathologist there, outside counseling, um, continued medical intervention as the student needed um, for headaches, for the nausea. Um, There was constant communication with the school by this parent. 
constant communication from injury one and the school opted to take a wait and see stance. And so this, this box to the right is a snapshot of why we should not wait and see. So this child from injury one, prior, prior to injury one, 99% attendance. Injury number two, attendance went down to 80%. Injury number three, 70%. By, by the time we're post injury number four, the students' attendance had dropped to 68%. So they were not even there for three-fourths of the school day. Their GPA went from a 4.0 to a 2.5. Um, and that was in a matter of, of three months. Um, and and there wasn't there wasn't coming back from that because there were no accommodations in place. There was nothing saying that this student can take extended time to make up these assignments or just show mastery. You know, there's 15 problems that are asking the same thing. Can you do three of these to show that you have mastery of that content? Um, there were um, deficiencies for graduation. So there he didn't have enough credits to graduate. Um, ooh, I am having trouble reading that last one. Dropped. Dropped oh, honors he, classes. Thank you. He had been in honors classes. He dropped his honors classes. And, and at this point, what you see is in this tiny course of time, this high school student went from university bound, going to be a lawyer, to not even being able to get into um, a, a college. So at the end of this, two years after that first initial injury, the district did finally put into place a 504 with accommodations. So the traumatic brain injury liaison me, in that region had been involved with this parent, had been in contact, had been advocating, and the district continued to wait and see. When when they wait and see, the SLP wasn't brought on. There were no OTs to address the deficits. I mean, this student was having trouble getting up and down the stairs. Well, if your class is on the second story, I mean, maybe that was the drop in the attendance is I can't get to the second story, so I'm just going to go ahead and head home. So early intervention is critical, is critical for these students. And, you know, I encourage my ITAP teams when they're seeing things like this, ask for a consult from physical or occupational therapy. Ask, ask if your OT or your PT has some strategies or some accommodations that you can implement to help this student bridge that gap. Um, so really quickly, I know we're at the end of time. The last several slides here, I didn't want you guys to leave without feeling like you had some things to take away and use. Um, Deb talked about the Siebert webinars. One of the things I did when I took this position over is I went through all of Siebert's webinars and kind of divided them into my school administration should be watching this. My SLPs should be watching this. So these are some webinars that I felt that my OTs and my PTs could really benefit from. But if you go to that return to school website, you have every webinar that's ever been presented um, through through Siebert. Um, these were just ones that I felt would be the most impactful for occupational and physical therapists. Um, and anything in here that's blue or green, like I said, those are links to websites or links to live places. Applications and programs for executive function um, needs, motor needs, these are the best suite of apps is very much an executive function. It looks at planning, organizing, time management, emotional regulation. So these are all links to actual um, things that have I have seen used or I have had students tell me this worked for me. These are resources that are sent out in Siebert's monthly newsletter. If you want to join your um, TBI team for your region, please go to their website and, and join us. Um, and lastly, these are a list of, <coughs> excuse me, resources that I gathered from my OTs, my PTs, and my other liaisons. The list on the left, um, Choose PT kind of gives physical therapists uh, an overview of how to work with students with TBI from their professional organization. 
um, Chromebook accessibility, lists of useful apps, um, OSAA concussion management. These are the regulations from the Oregon Sports Authority. The links on the right side are actual places where students can receive different types of therapies related to their brain injury, um, specifically for counties. We are working on getting more information for each region. Right now we have Southern Oregon ESD, Lane and Lincoln, or, or Lane and Lynn counties. The other thing I would recommend is if you want to get to know more about people with TBI is joining some support groups. Um, I am a member of the Facebook TBI Survivor and Caregiver Support Groups, and there are questions posed by caregivers and survivors daily that that can that help me with my practice. This is what these people are looking for and needing. How do I impart that information to my students and their families?